watch COS care about us in ways my friends attending larger universities did not get. COS made it clear through its actions that we are a priority and they believed in us and were invested in our success. We find a sense of community here. We find our people here. I am proud of my achievements here. I am proud of the irreplaceable experiences and opportunities I received here and most of all, of the people I was lucky enough to meet while here. I wouldn't trade my time here for the world. Good morning! Now nobody get hurt, please. Nobody get hurt doing this. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning and welcome back to the College of the Sequoia's 2022 Fall Semester Convocation. If we have not met yet, and that's a distinct possibility given a two-year pandemic and all the people that we've hired, but if we haven't met yet, I'm Brent Calvin, thrilled to serve as your superintendent and president. I've said it before, it's not a job that I take lightly. I very much appreciate the trust and responsibility that you've placed in me, and I do everything within my power to always represent all of us a thousand strong uh, in a positive light. So thank you for that responsibility. If you're joining us here for the first time, first of all, welcome. Welcome to the COS uh, family. Uh, you'll find it's a, it's a wonderful place to, to work and serve students. But if you're joining us here for the first time, this is one of two opportunities that we have throughout the year to come together as a family, look in the rearview mirror and see what we did well last year, what we still need to work on this coming year, and also look through the windshield at uh, what's in front of us. And I think we have a fabulous, fabulous year in front of us, and I just can't wait to get after it. Uh, today's format, uh, for those of you that have been here before, will follow a similar um, uh, agenda. I'll have some introductions to make, some thank yous, some acknowledgements. Uh, this morning I've got a lot of pictures to share as part of those thank yous. And then we'll jump right into some data sets, uh, share kind of how we did in relation to our strategic plan. Uh, I've got some fun videos and stories to share along the way. Um, and we should be out of here in about an hour, at which point we'll have a whole bunch of snacks right next door to the south of us. Uh, we're joined uh, remotely by folks next door in Sawtooth, uh, one door over in Ponderosa, and then a couple of doors over in Hospital Rock. So welcome to all of you. We look forward to seeing you for snacks um, afterwards as well. Uh, and one little side note is we have about three times as much food as we really need next door. <laughs> so um, take a big portion, take a big snack, and then take a little bit more with you um, to your division meetings because if you don't take it, it comes back to my office. <laughs> and they all have a lot better willpower than I have. And I don't think any of you want a president that's bigger than a sumo wrestler, right? <laughs> so please, do your part, have a big snack, and take some, take some with you. The first thing I want to do is introduce our board of trustees. You've heard me say it before, we are so lucky to have the board that we have. You can look at the state level, the national level, or excuse me, state, national, regional, and local level. Boards really struggle right now to get along and make good decisions. Our board does not have that issue. Uh, they are very uh, reflective and uh, committed to their jobs, and they make good decisions, primarily because they always put students, employee groups, and their constituency groups first. And they've really found a nice groove uh, supporting all three of those groups at the same time. And I don't think you need to look any further than maybe our paychecks. Districts across the state are arguing about how to, how to disperse this, this cost of living adjustment. Our board said, let's give it all to employees and let's tack on a 1% kicker. So if you haven't gotten your latest paycheck yet, it, it's, 
it's nice, and it's because of our board. Our board wanted to do something special for their employee groups, and they did. So I'm just lucky to work with them, and let's meet them. Thank you. Thank you. Our board president representing Ward 5 is Mr. John Lane. Our board vice president, a former board president representing Ward 2 is Mr. Ken Nunes. Our board clerk representing Ward 3, many say, including me, many say a future board president, Mr. Raymond Macareno. And then finally, two former board presidents themselves, Trustee Lori Cardoza and Trustee Greg Sherman. Thank you for being here with us this morning and thank you for everything you do on behalf of employees, students, and community members. Very much appreciate that. Uh, now then, uh, I normally spend some time thanking the people that make these convocations um, entertaining or at least halfway bearable because trust me, left to my own devices, these things would be extremely short and you'd all be thankful because they'd be really boring. Uh, these folks do a great job. Let me thank first of all Nick Terry and Courtney Bouvie, recently Haney, up in the booth. I had just gotten to the point where I knew it was uh, Bouvie instead of Beauvais after five years, uh, and, and then she went and got married during the, uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic. So congratulations to Courtney. I uh, also want to thank our technology folks, uh, Aaron Albright and Nels Herring. I think they're covering one of our overflow rooms, but they have been busy all summer long with these high flex classrooms, but they took time out to help with, with our technology here this morning. So thank you to Aaron and Nels. We're going to see a lot of data sets today, and I want to thank our research department led by Dr. Dolly Osterk, as well as Ryan Barry Souza and Tyler Verdon. They work really, really hard all year round, but especially in the summer, to prepare these data sets for us this morning. So thanks to that group. Thank you especially to our marketing folks, Lauren Fishback and Vanessa Lamb. We've done an excellent job of telling our story over the last two, three, four years, something that most community colleges don't do, and we didn't do it for the first 90 years we were in existence. But over the last four or five years, we've done a much better job because of these two, whether it's TV commercials, radio commercials, print media, social media, bus wraps, billboards, they do all of that, and they do it at a very high level, and they also make this, this convocation uh, pretty interesting, hopefully. So let's thank Lauren and Vanessa. <laughs> also like to thank our foundation board president for everything they do for us throughout the year. That's Mr. Tom Gianpietro. <laughs> Tom, you here? <laughs> He's here somewhere because he brought us donuts backstage, so I know Tommy's here. Thank there he is. Thank you, Tommy. Appreciate your help. Thank you also to Megan Tierce in the President's Office, as well as the entire President's Office for the support that, that they provide uh, me and others. Uh, I love coming to work, number one, because I love my job, but number two, they make it uh, so doggone fun to come to work. So thanks, thanks to the Orange Brigade over here. And then uh, finally, as part of that Orange Brigade, I want, want to just thank my wife, Renee, for joining us here this morning. Thank you. So normally, I, I spend some time thanking individual groups, and I kind of go through student services, academic services, administrative services, the president's office. Uh, I thought what I would do today is share uh, a number of, of pictures from the last year because I think they say a, a, a picture tells a thousand words or something like that, and, and, and that's really the case here. Because in spite of the dumpster fires that were going on around us, we were able to do some fabulous, fabulous things here at the College of the Sequoias. When the rest of the state, it seemed like, was closing their doors, not really engaging students and certainly not engaging community members, we were. And I'm so proud of, of this team. And I've got, oh, 15 pictures or so that I kind of want to work through. I'll, I'll end up going all the way back a whole year. But I want to start with some pictures from just last week. And that's our giant days. Man, what a turnout we had. Here's a picture from, from Hanford. 
Here's a picture from Teleri, and uh, here's one of the sessions we had here in Visalia. These were voluntary orientations. Um, you could have done it remotely, and we just got flooded with students coming on all three of our campuses. Uh, each day culminated in a nice lunch for our students. It was just a fabulous time, and you can imagine the amount of uh, time and effort that went into planning these things. So thank you to everybody in Student Services for, for making that happen. And then last spring, how many of these uh, individual graduation ceremonies do we have? I was trying to count, I got to 14, and with my memory, we probably had 18 or 19, I just couldn't think of them all, but it's amazing how fun these individual graduation ceremonies are and how special they are for family and friends and uh, what a great outreach to our community. I just wanted to thank the folks that, that put these type of events on. This is the Fire Academy. You see Rick Smith up there in the top right hand corner. He's always good for a good cry. I don't know if Rick is here. He's always good for a good cry. It makes the rest of us cry uh, when he uh, bids farewell to his uh, cadets. Uh, this is the physical therapy uh, assistant program graduation right here in this theater. Another special one, but uh, nursing, EOP and S, uh, pharmacy, uh, the list goes on and on with these kind of graduation ceremonies. Here's a, um, a farm awards dinner, uh, ag awards dinner down at the Tulare campus. This is, this is just about my favorite. It's our ESL program graduation ceremony. Um, we packed the quad with people. We used to pack the theater and ran out of space. Uh, it's an amazing night. And uh, here's a few of us fooling around after, after uh, that ceremony. Really, really special. Uh, we also did a number of uh, speaker, um, uh, guest speakers for our community. This one was, was about the Visalia Ransacker. We partnered with the Visalia Police Department to put this on. We filled up the Ponderosa, so whatever that seats, uh, 300 or so. We had overflow of about 100 here on campus, and we had 250 joining us online. Really special night. I got more, I got more thank you cards from people regarding this event just randomly, uh, than I've probably received the rest of my 20 years here. It was amazing how many people this resonated with and thanked us. And, and, and there was a, a special connection to COS. If you don't know, um, one of our faculty members, uh, Claude Snelling, um, his life was taken at the hands of the Visalia Ransacker. And a very sad day in the history of the College of the Sequoias, and they finally apprehended this guy with, with DNA, with DNA uh, evidence several decades after he uh, committed those crimes. So this was a big night for us. A lot of healing went on. Claude Snelling's daughter was in attendance. It was, it was really an emotional, emotional night, and I was happy that COS could take the lead and, and host this event. Uh, we also had uh, a civic uh, engagement series. Uh, I know that uh, there's Octavio Barajas on the right, Randy Villegas, Marla Proc now did a wonderful job uh, bringing in fabulous speakers. I think this is Dr. Sintley Rodriguez, uh, the next one um, was uh, a, a, a cause for, for, for farm workers. Um, Octavio also led a, uh, a film production, that's not really the case. Uh, out on the quad, we showed Caesar's Last Fast, and uh, Oscar De Leon there on the left, that's Robert Bustos with the microphone, but Oscar De Leon there on the left, he, he was a um, photographer and videographer for years and years, and, and he had some of the last footage of Cesar Chavez's life on his deathbed, just by chance. Happened to be there and, and filming, and it made this, this, this film, Cesar's Last Fast, and uh, just a, a really fun night. Octavio put it on, and I think the whole night went flawless. If Octavio was here, I think he'd agree. The only challenge we had was taking that big inflatable inflatable screen, getting all the air out, and then sticking it back in that bag. It never works that way. <laughs> he and I were working up a sweat, and it was like November. But uh, anyway, fabulous night, and I just want to thank everyone that played a part in, in those kinds of uh, speaker engagement, uh, community engagement events. Uh, this is our, our COS Awards Luncheon in, in May. Lots and lots of fun. I uh, was able to... to, to award several people with the Giant of the Year Award for their respective areas. Had a lot of fun. You can tell it was Cinco de Mayo or just about. I think it was planned for Cinco de Mayo and we moved it back a day. 
but all the decorations uh, were for Cinco de Mayo. The PACE committee does a wonderful job. We are so lucky. How about a big round of applause for the PACE committee? They're so active that we just kind of take for granted these fun things happen and uh, they're behind it and they did a great job with this. In fact, they even found a, if you can see back there, they found a sombrero that was big enough to fit on this big melon of mine. And so I felt kind of obliged to wear it for the entire, for the entire um, event, which was great, but it ran a little bit long. And at some point somebody said, hey, uh, such and such is having a graduation ceremony in Porter Fieldhouse and you're late, get over there. So I ran over there, bust through the doors, and, and uh, Brittany was up on stage, and it, it was just perfect timing, so she's calling me up, get up here. So I ran up there and uh, faced all our graduates and their families and loved ones and everything, and, and only then did I realize, because people in the front row were kind of chuckling, that I still had the sombrero <laughs> on. <laughs> and it wasn't Cinco de Mayo, and, and they had no idea what was going on in the middle of our campus. <laughs> And there's like, why is this big guy showing up with a sombrero on? Is that like every day? So that was, a, that was an awkward moment. I didn't even explain it. I just went with it. Uh, and anyway, it was a small price to pay to have two fantastic events on, on one day. What else we got here? Oh, we had two magical runs to the state final four by our basketball teams. Uh, so much fun to get behind these teams. Community members came out. The Porterfield House was packed the entire month of February with, with um, tough playoff games. And then both teams advanced to the Elite Eight at the state tournament. We both won those games. And then we lost the, the, the following night in the Final Four. But uh, man, what a run. And it's just so fun to see um, students, employees, and community members get behind a team. And they got behind both of our teams. It's, it's pretty cool just to have one team go to the Elite Eight every 10 years or so. That's kind of the standard. If you're a good program, that's what you do. Well, we had both teams advance to the Final Four, and that's like the third time in six years, I believe, that both teams have done it. So hats off to our basketball teams. And then staying on the uh, athletics front for just a moment, uh, we brought back football games on campus for the first time in at least 60 years, and, and maybe ever, I just don't know. Um, but we just felt like in addition to enhancing the, the student experience, it's also wonderful to have three or 4,000 community members come on our campus, people that wouldn't otherwise be on our campus. Um, and my next slide will even elaborate more on, on what that does. But it's so healthy to have our community members come out and see what a special place this is. Football and the fine arts and all sports really are examples of how we do that. Um, I'll also have some slides later on in the presentation sharing how we're enhancing that old practice field to really spruce it up for our community members. It's an exciting project and it's going on right now. And then finally, this is the kind of the big showstopper. How many of you came out for Beauty and the Beast? Yeah, quite a number of you, right? It was amazing, folks. I've been here 20 years and lived through all kinds of great stuff. This was the most surreal moment that I've had here at the College of the Sequoias. And uh, it lasted for three nights. How's that for a moment? It was just unbelievable, the job that, that, that uh, our folks did, um, recreating Beauty and the Beast outside in our quad for uh, literally six or 700 community members all three nights. Our whole quad was packed with people in their lawn chairs. I got a shot as an example. Three straight nights of that. It was amazing. Uh, Chris Mangles, James McDonald, unbelievable job. Uh, obviously assisted by Nick, Courtney. We even brought Steve Lamar back, uh, blew the cobwebs off of him and, and brought, him, <laughs> <laughs> brought him out of retirement. Um, uh, Michael Tackett, John Sorber, uh, Teresa Bonner, they, they were there to support as well. Just an unbelievable night and uh, got a whole bunch of thank you cards for that as well. It's cool being the president because you just show up for things and then all of a sudden these thank you cards start flooding in. Uh, but unbelievable job by, by that team. I was, I was, so, I was so proud. I, I needed to like go up a, a shirt size so my shirt buttons would stop popping off. I was so proud of the College of the Scoys for, for, for pulling that off. It was just an amazing 
three nights uh, here on the Visalia Quad. Thank you. Thank you. It's almost time for a video because, trust me, I need one right now. But um, I, I wanted to also share some updates for our, for our facilities because I understand that not everybody is, has, has been here in a while. And we do have a number of projects either in process or um, breaking ground this fall. All three campuses are getting a, a pretty fresh upgrade. And I want to start with uh, our Tulare campus. Um, we, it's finally time to do our phase two, our career technical education expansion, and this is going to be big time. Uh, just for context, you see at the top left, uh, that's an overview of our campus. It's about 500 acres in Tulare, right along Bardsley Avenue. That first blue rectangle is Building A. That's our administrative offices, student services offices, and the Learning Resource Center. Uh, the larger blue rectangle to the uh, south of Building A is Building B. Uh, that's where most of our classroom space is, most of our faculty offices. Uh, the next little sliver there is our physical plant, and then the larger uh, blue rectangle to the south is, is here, Building C. That's the nicest welding facility in the state of California. I'm sure of it. I mean, it's, it's big time. Randy Emery, Chris Huff do an amazing job with not only their program, but with this facility. It is just gorgeous. The American Welding Society does all kinds of, of contests and events there because it really is a big time facility. Um, so what we're doing here on, on the, what will be the east and then on the south side of that in the orange is um, uh, building space for probably eight or nine more CTE programs. Automotive, construction, electrical, HVAC, industrial maintenance, industrial technology, and, and a couple of others. Faculty have been very involved in the design of these buildings and uh, lab space, classroom space, and then collaboration space out here in the middle of this horseshoe for big projects that can't fit inside, big projects that need to be collaborated on. It's gonna be really, really special. We are breaking ground uh, here in the next month, and that will be open for the fall of 2024. So two years from today, We'll be uh, opening up that facility and should be very, very nice. The uh, architecture is the Art Deco that we've come to expect from uh, the Tulare campus. Here's a couple of renderings. And then I've got a uh, overview. Uh, so on the far left is Bardsley and then right on the, the, the building two, closest to Bardsley is building A, then building B, that physical plant, uh, the welding shop, and then that dirt area that's the closest I could find to a picture of our dirt area. That is where the uh, CTE complex will go. It's really, really a special project. Looking forward uh, to, to, to getting started with that. Then in Hanford, I think I showed you some of these from uh, in the spring at our spring convocation, but, but uh, we've got a, a public safety building to the far west behind our amphitheater there. And then to the far east, we've got the hub administration and educational building and prior to all this landscape and hardscape coming in it was just lawn space and it was almost like two different facilities and it seemed like you were walking three football fields to get from one to the other. We've, we've added this and, and even these pictures don't do it justice. It, it's, it's, it's gorgeous um, now that it's grown in. Really, really special and then to the north of, uh, of the hub here we've got um, uh, solar sh shade structures going in right now and I'm also told that we're inching up the priority list at the state for a science building in Hanford. That would be a game changer, game changer for us folks. So looking forward to that, and I think I have one more picture. Yeah, here we go. That gives you an idea about what the view is like going back towards the public safety building, but the folks in Hanford do a fabulous job, and again, that science building would be a game changer for this campus, so looking forward to this. Uh, and then finally, we've got a few things to update you on uh, in Visalia. Uh, and I've circled this one building at the bottom left, and it's, it's ironic that that's the one building on this map that we don't currently own. <laughs> We've been chasing this thing hard, probably for as long as I've worked here, but at least 10 years, chasing it hard. And Visalia Unified always, um, always had at least. And uh, they, they ended up um, 
uh, letting that lease expire this summer. So about three weeks ago, we were able to snap this up. We signed our own 10-year lease with an option to, to buy. And the reason that we're so excited about this, if you don't recognize it, um, it's this. It's a 3,000 square foot, what they use as a dance studio. We are going to use it as a student support center. Uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, mental health referrals. We have a lot of county agencies that come in and partner with us to serve our students, and, and they need a, a quick and convenient place to, to stop and then meet students. And, and give us a couple of months to, to bougie this up, and it's going to be <laughs> wonderful, wonderful for, for, for students. I want to thank Miriam Salam. There she is. Miriam, as you know, does a fa fabulous do job with our foster youth program, and she's taken on this role as well, and uh, really looking forward to how we can serve students better right along Mooney Boulevard. Should be great, great for our uh, students. And then right across Meadow is the um, uh, Educational Support Services Building. I gave you a preview of this in the spring. If you haven't been over there, um, try to get over there and see. We have, we have uh, it's completely framed, steel's in the air, and we will be open this time next year, fall of 2023. As a reminder, this is going to consolidate uh, a lot of our support services, access and ability, tutorial, the writing lab, the math, the math lab, uh, should be uh, um, really great for students, and it's got a, just a beautiful exterior and a beautiful courtyard out front. Lots of orange, blue, steel, and glass, just like we like it. It's right along Mooney Boulevard, so, um, and it's a, it's a departure from our normal architectural design, so we're excited about kind of this change in, in, um, in design. Here's the lobby. I'm still, I'm still pining for an office here in this big, nice, you know, I'm living in the 1930s over here. <laughs> I need something like this. And then we've got this gorgeous classroom, these gorgeous classrooms as, as well. Looking forward to this. Again, fall of 2023. It'll be here before, before we know it. Now, the, the next one I'd like to share is what I alluded to earlier, and that is uh, a renovation of our old practice football and soccer field. And this is really, really exciting. Uh, by May of 2023, this is what you'll see from parking lot 7. Pretty amazing, huh? Thank you. A nice courtyard here off of parking lot seven, concession stand, uh, restrooms. Along the right hand side is, is uh, visitor seating. On the back side of that visitor seating are bleachers for our tennis complex. And, um, and then that gorgeous scoreboard, which you can see from uh, the, the north view here. Uh, will be just fabulous for playing our, our promotional videos before and after the game, maybe even at halftime. That's what we do in Porter Fieldhouse. Like, if you come to a volleyball game or a basketball game, you're going to hear all about the programs we have because one after another, we just play our videos and kind of brainwash the sports fans in, <laughs> into, into knowing what we got going on here at the College of Sequoia. So we'll do the same thing with football fans. They just don't know it yet. Uh, this is the view from the uh, home side. Again, gorgeous scoreboard there. Down the right part of your screen, you see the press box. And then uh, here's some close-ups uh, close of the um, plaza, courtyard plaza, um, as you enter. It should be a lot of fun, and, and we're really, really excited. Not only great for our students, but again, getting three, 4,000 community members on our campus every other Saturday in the fall, big time. Really. We have a big time opportunity to, to spread the love of COS to people that wouldn't or, ordinarily be here. They'd be down at the high school field at Mineral King Bowl. So we're switching gears, and I think it's going to be a really, really positive thing. Then finally, I've got two final projects to show you, and these are still kind of in process, if you, if you will. You'll recall that five years ago, um, the college got tired of waiting for someone else to bring a four-year university to Tulare County. And uh, we're the largest, the largest, excuse me, second largest county without a publicly funded four-year university in the state. 58 counties, and we rank second only to San Mateo County, which you guys know San Mateo County. There's probably four or five universities within, within a 20-minute drive of there, but they don't have any in that county. 
and then we're, when, you, when you include our entire district, Tulare and Hanford, we are the largest region in the state without a publicly, four year, publicly funded four-year university. 25 years ago, we were a finalist for UC Merced, and they went that direction. Who can, who can explain why? But uh, it is what it is, and, and so for 25 years, we've all gone to meetings and, and heard city and county leaders talking about, we need a four-year university in Tulare County and so forth. And so finally, we just got tired of hearing that. We had a partnership with Fresno State to, to provide classes here and there and, and a, a master's program, you know, when it would fill and so forth. So we gave them a, a, a nearly new facility, renovated facility, and told them, you owe us five degree completion programs. And, and they've come through on four of those, and the fifth will be next fall. They've also added two master's programs, and they offer general ed courses for their Fresno students here in the South Valley. All told, in five years, they've served about 3,700 unduplicated um, students. Pretty, pretty special. And so now we feel like it's the time to expand on that relationship, not really for COS, but for the entire region. This, this really isn't a COS thing so much as it's a region thing. And if nobody else is going to care about it, we need to. And um, so we've, we've invested about five to six million dollars over the last four or five years to buy three apartment complexes um, right behind our Fresno State Center, the dirt at the corner of Tulare and Mooney, as well as that first building to the north of the, the, the corner at Tulare and, and Mooney. And this November, we are going to go to our voters. We're going to ask for a general bond measure to fund not only the university center for students to take their classes, but also uh, an adjoining student union, much like you'd find at UCLA or something like that, where there's a bookstore, food service, and then student services wrapped around in, in one place. And um, so look for more on that. We're going to have several public forums. I think I have 40 speaking engagements this fall. So at lunchtime, if you don't see my car in Circle Drive, I'm not just clowning around somewhere. I'm, 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 I'm eating a service club rubber chicken lunch and, 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 and talking about what we got going here at the College of the Sequoias. So I got a little video to share, and it's about 90 seconds. And as I was going through it this morning, I'm like, man, we should have put some music on it. So uh, I don't know if John Sorber's here or somebody can hum, but uh, <laughs> anyway, this is, a, this is a little like flyover of, of, of the campus, and then specifically it ends up kind of going right between Student Union and uh, Educational Support Services Building and, and right up to the University Center, and then I'll have some still shots after that to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> kind of cool to think that that's our campus, right? I mean, I, I, it's, it's, you don't really realize until you get up high that this is a pretty phenomenal place. There's the university center right there at the corner. It's big time. And here's that stretch. You see the student union. Student union would be right where our current cafeteria and automotive shop are. Shady Avenue here would no longer go through to Tulare. We would abandon that, hopefully rename this uh, Sequoias Avenue or something like that. Nice courtyard out front. Fabulous Sequoia tree <laughs> in the lobby. Uh, who's going to water that thing? <laughs> anyway, we'll be working on this uh, this fall. It's going to be really, really exciting if we can get this done. <laughs> Those that you see there, the, the two circles at once, that's where we're located there in relation to educational support services. Here's some still shots. Kawia on the left, uh, a fabulous gathering place for, for students. This is the thoroughfare going to, between the two buildings on the way out to the University Center. 
again, gathering space. This gorgeous lobby, classroom space, and then back out. <clears throat> so we're really, really, really excited uh, about this. If you look at the over, just a picture of that quadrant over our campus, it really does look like a, a mini four-year university, which is the point here. As we'll get into the data a little bit, we've got a bit of a failure to launch issue with the number of transfer prepared students we have versus the number that actually transfer. And I think there's many reasons for that. Part of it is, is sometimes we give people degrees and they go right into a career. That's fabulous. But part of it's also maybe financial and or cultural that students want to stay here in Tulare County and there's, there's, there's just nothing past past what we give them. So this would be a pretty special project if we could pull it off. Now then, I do have a video to share with you unrelated to facilities. Um, and it's, it's about our local heroes. This is a, um, a marketing campaign that, that, that uh, we put together about six months ago or so. The foundation's doing their own. And, and just framing the job that we do with, with um, students to prepare them to be local heroes, whether it's law enforcement or fire personnel or nursing or other allied health professions, we do produce local heroes here. And so I thought I, thought I was gonna beat the, t the TV commercials, I was sure of it. And then last night I saw one of our, our commercials. So this campaign is starting right now, literally like last night, but I wanted to show you the first one that we've developed. College of the Sequoia's graduates are your local heroes. Over the past three years, the Fire Academy, Police Academy, and Registered Nursing programs have awarded over 800 degrees to local heroes. Thank you for your support of these programs and the future of our region. Thank you to Vanessa. And by the way, we're accepting applications for somebody else to do the voiceovers. <laughs> uh, now then, we've got a whole bunch of uh, data sets to, to get through. I'm excited to, to kind of walk through it with you and tell you sort of how we did in relation to our strategic plan uh, over the last 12 months. Um, but, but first, I think we need a little refresher because we've got a lot of new people in the room. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's important for us to remember how we operate. And on the left, we've got the participatory governance structure, uh, our board, my office, and then we have three senates, and those are uh, uh, codified in, in law to make recommendations either to my office or directly to the board of trustees. This has really clarified who makes decisions, who makes recommendations, and how we get things done here at the College of the Sequoias. The District Governance Senate is made up of representatives from across all three sites, from across all of our employee groups, and, and from all of our service areas, academic, student services, and, and administrative services. And they all, each of the three have their own, oh, excuse me, that's the District Governance Senate. Academic Senate is a full-time and part-time faculty, and then obviously Student Senate is made up of students. They all have committees, that work on initiatives or little projects, and then they bring their recommendations back to their respective senates for further handling. That senate decides who it's going to go to next. It really has clarified the way we operate here at the Co uh, College of Sequoias. And then on the right, uh, we have our model for integrated planning, and what this does is ensures that the resources we spend, whether they're financial or our time or human resources, that they all funnel up and, and serve our mission. And we do that because the mission is the basis for our 10-year master plan. That master plan has four broad goal areas. Remember, growth, success, equity, and sustainability. That, in turn, drives our strategic plan, which we do every normally every three years. This time, we want it to coincide with the ending of our master plan, so it's four years. The strategic plan has day-to-day, uh, week-to-week, -week, month -week, month-to-month objectives, things that we're working on to, to drive those broad goal areas within our master plan. Uh, it's also the basis for our institutional program review, how we al allocate resources, and how we implement our plans. Towards the end of the year, we start to assess our outcomes. How did we do? And we find there's some good, there's some bad, and there's some ugly. 
We report all of that out in our annual report on the master plan. And the bad and the ugly get to go on another ride around the, uh, around the wheel there for another year in hopes that we can do better the next time around. That's a um, continuous improvement. That's a cycle of continuous improvement. That's why it's very, very important that we close that loop and make sure that, that if we're not doing something well, we better put it into the strategic plan for, for the next year. Um, if none of this makes sense to you, we've got three manuals that can explain it all. And, and frankly, here after t 10 years, we're still using these on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis. A lot of times you, you, you publish things and then you never use them. We use these a lot. And throughout the year, uh, we come across things that need to be changed or tweaked for one reason or another. During the summertime, we make those changes and then we republish about this time, first week of school every single year. Again, we're in the midst of a 10-year master plan and a four-year strategic plan. Check out the numbers there. They're both going to expire in 2025. So what do you think we're going to be doing in 2024? <laughs> Working really, really hard. And so if, if you were thinking about retiring in, in 2024, don't. <laughs> we're going to need your help. Uh, hang around till at least 2026 because in addition to, to uh, writing and, and publishing these two documents, we're also going to have to write our institutional self-evaluation report for our creditors and then host a visit in either the fall of 2025 or the spring of 2026. So it's going to be a busy couple of years. So put off that retirement for another couple of years. Uh, again, the annual report on the master plan is presented to the Board of Trustees every December. I expect to see all of you at our December board meeting to, to hear me report out on how we did. And uh, this is our first major goal area. Uh, goal area number one, which is growth. Uh, from the very beginning, we wanted to increase student enrollment relative to our population group and our workforce needs. We've got uh, just one objective in this area. And prior to the pandemic, it looked like a cakewalk, uh, which was to increase our full-time equivalent students by 2% over four years. Frankly, the only challenge we've ever had in the area of growth is, is making sure that we didn't outkick our coverage, as, as Travis Burkett likes to say. We never want to serve, um, way, serve students way above our cap because it's a painful process when they cut budgets and you have to get back down to cap. So just trying to have a regulator on, on our growth so that we were always uh, over but not that much over our growth cap. Well, now, as you'll see from this next slide, it's a challenging time. The pandemic wiped out about 14% of our full-time equivalent students. Uh, and, and that was made up, as you'll see in another slide or two, it was made up a lot with students that, that would have been full-time and dropped down to a part-time load. And um, thankfully for us and every other district in the state, by the way, there's some districts that are down by a third, 40%. Um, so we feel pretty lucky to be down 14%, but we're all we are all uh, protected at the 2020 levels. So that's the good news, protected for another year or, or two. And we've spent the last two weeks really tracking, really tracking enrollment. And at this point, we're tracking back to the fall of 2019, which is that 2020 year. Um, and we are just about three and a half, four percent off the pace from fall of 2019. So we're crushing it right now. I thought it would take a full two or three years, and that's what the state is kind of forecasting, two or three years to come out of this. College of the Sequoias is, is, is making a run at doing it in one year. We are close to closing the gap and getting back to fall 2019 numbers. So congratulations to everybody that's played a role in that. Thank you. Thank you. Here's some demographics, and our, our research office has done a fabulous job of publishing this report, understanding changes in enrollment during the pandemic. Uh, you're welcome to go to the website and, and take a look at this. You, saw, you see that our, our female students hang, hold, held on pretty well. Um, it was our, our, our male, male students and, and uh, undisclosed gender students that, that um, disappeared on us a, a bit. And then in terms of uh, student group, everybody was, was down. The blue is head count and the green is enrollments or basically what ends up being full-time equivalent students, what, what we're paid on. Um, 
and you can see from, from this chart, we lost a lot more enrollment than we lost people. And that, that, that jibes with, with our anecdotal phone calls with hundreds of students. Students just said, I, I, you know, I can't do a full load online, but I can do one or two classes. So uh, we attribute a lot of these data to, to that fact. Folks just, I'm gonna sit out the pandemic by just taking one or two classes as opposed to a full load. With the exception of our, our K through 12 partners, uh, those numbers, high school students dual enrolled and concurrently enrolled rose almost 20% headcount, 15% enrollment. And so I guess if there's a silver lining, it's that lots of high school students were taking our classes the last two years which led to another increase in our high school students uh, up to an all-time high of, of 2,149 students. Uh, I don't consider this to be our primary mission. I know most of you don't as, as well. I think our, our first responsibility is uh, high school graduates that are coming here for their higher ed. Um, but, but I also really believe in giving high school students an on-ramp into higher ed. Many of these students maybe have never thought of themselves as college material or, or thought it would be too difficult. So it is nice to ease them in with one class per semester or so while they're in high school. It's just a, an easier on-ramp to, to higher ed. And I think we're doing a wonderful job of kind of finding that balance because there are districts out there that are all in, all in with, with dual enrollment uh, to the detriment of maybe their, their um, regular college students. Uh, now then I want to jump right into student success. And I've got a fabulous picture here. I think, yeah, Dr. Allison Ferry Avey does a great job down in Tulare, and there's a great shot of her and one of her students. So success is pretty straightforward. We want to improve the rate at which our uh, students succeed, whether it's degrees, certificates, or, or their transfer objectives. We've got four fabulous objectives here. The first is uh, to increase the number of degrees and certificates that we uh, award. Uh, the second is to increase the number of students that, that are transfer ready, first of all, and that actually transfer. We'll get to those numbers in just a minute. The uh, third objective here is increasing the percentage of students that complete both their transfer level quantitative reasoning, QR, formerly known as math, um, as well as transfer level English in their very first year. And then finally, increase the percentage of our career technical education students that, that uh, find meaningful employment uh, upon taking uh, a certain level of, of, of classes with, with us. I've said it before, these are the kind of obje objectives that really stretch our organization. And if we push really hard on this two, three years from now, we're gonna, we're gonna be happy we did. You're gonna see a lot of improvement and hats off to the people that work very hard on this strategic plan because this will stretch our organization. Uh, you see we've got some wonderful numbers to report. Uh, all of our awards are up 65% over five years. Our degrees are up 44% and certificates are up 120%. The orange, the, the orange there, um, degrees 1,775 and certificates 994, those are our second or third most all time, like 96 years, and they're the second or third highest, which is awesome. The only caveat to that is the first or second highest in those categories happened over the last two years. So even though they're great numbers, we are in a little, we're all on a little bit of a dip from our all-time highs, and, and I'm, I'm confident we can turn that around in the next year or two. Obviously, it's, it's, it's all pandemic-driven, but we do have some work to do in this area. Uh, we saw a similar phenomenon on the uh, career and technical education side. Uh, 634 degrees, 918 certificates. Those are second or third all time, 96 years. Second or third all time, but they're also second or third over the last three years. So uh, we need to correct this, uh, this trend. CTE awards overall, 87% up in five years. Degrees up 60% and, and, and certificates up 112%. So great numbers, but we just need to be aware that that we're, we're going down slowly and we've got to pick it back up and I'm, I'm sure we will post pandemic. Uh, in terms of transfer, we've, we've continued to be the, the uh, number three uh, institution in the entire state in terms of the number of associate degrees for transfer that, that we offer students and that's huge. First in the Valley, it's led to uh, uh, 876 of our students graduating with an associate degree 
four transfer, 876 is the second most all time. Uh, happy with that. And then I just love this hat here, um, loosely paraphrased. And if I've really butchered it, tell me afterwards. <laughs> Let people think that I'm pretty bilingual here. But I, I, I think what it says is, thanks mom and dad for helping me to fly. What a fantastic message. I remember when we, when we allowed, started allowing these, these messages on the top of graduation. I got some nasty grams from some of you. You, you purists did not want to have these messages on top of graduation hats, but we monitor them to make sure the message is appropriate, but they're pretty special. They're always a shout out to, to parents and grandparents and really sweet messages like this. And again, if I got that wrong, tell me afterwards. Let the other 400 people think that I was right. Um, let's see, where are we? Oh, uh, transfer outcomes. This is our, our transfer prepared students. I talked earlier about kind of that failure to launch thing. Last year we had uh, 1,874 transfer prepared students, but, but uh, only about two thirds of those, maybe a little less, maybe, maybe 60% will actually transfer. And uh, that's something that, that, that we need to co combat a little bit, but still fabulous numbers to know that we're preparing students to transfer. And um, for five years, we've just been on a, a, an, an uphill trajectory is fabulous. And here's the number of the students that actually transferred. That was up 3% to 1,057. Six-year average of 958. A fabulous picture on the left there of, of uh, one of our veteran students. Um, so again, they, they, these are fabulous numbers. We should all be um, happy with them or encouraged with them, but not satisfied. I don't think anybody in here is satisfied with those numbers. I think we all know we can do more, especially when we know we have close to 1,900 transfer prepared students at any one time. Um, so I think it's just education and then hopefully our partnership with Fresno State will start to pay some dividends in this way as well. I think, I think part of it is students do not want to leave um, what they're familiar with. And they, they're much more comfortable walking across the street for their four year, for their four year degree. And then the final slide in this area is just show you, showing you how we stack up with, with uh, the other community colleges in the valley here. Uh, this is UC and CSU transfers. These are always lag behind. These are uh, uh, 2020, 2021 numbers. Uh, we won't get the 2021, 22 numbers for another few months, but you can see we rank third behind Fresno City College and Bakersfield College, and then ahead of Reedley, Clovis, Porterville, and both West Hills colleges. So really, really good stuff. Okay. Time for another video, and this is really a fun one. Can't wait for you to, to meet this individual on the screen. We had hoped to have him come out and surprise you right after the, the, the video. Um, I, I think he's the, the first uh, Olympic silver medalist that, that we've had uh, here at the College of Sequoia, certainly in, in recent memory. Occasionally we'll have a track athlete or um, something compete in the Olympics. Uh, but this individual won a silver medal um, at the last Olympics in boxing. He's from Tulare, his name's Richard Torres, he goes by Kiki, and uh, yeah. I bumped into him in the cafeteria and I said, hey, I recognize you, and he goes, hey, I recognize you. He is the most humble guy um, but what he's been able to do is just phenomenal, and you're going to love this video. And again, we thought he'd be able to, we'd be able to sneak him out afterwards and introduce him to all of you, and I think he caught wind of the fact that I wanted to... <laughs> wait, wait, I guess it's this way. I think he caught wind of the fact that I wanted to spar a little bit, and he just, he, he stayed in Colorado training for his next professional fight. Hey, Kiki, I'm just kidding. I don't want any part of you, but... Um, <laughs> It would have been fun though, right? So we'll try, to, we'll try to hook that up in the future. But enjoy this, what a sweet kid he is. So I boxed my entire life. First time I got the ring, I was four. First time I fought, I was eight. In my amateur career, I've been able to travel to 15 different countries through USA Boxing. And on top of that, I went to the Olympics and got a silver medal there. Everything's going really well on the boxing side, but you know, one of my favorite quotes is, live as if you were to die today, learn as if you were to live forever by Gandhi and I'm really trying to use that to my fullest. Uh, school is one of my favorite things to do growing up. I was a valedictorian in high school, and uh, I just really like wanted to continue my education, and uh, there's no better place than CLS. I'm currently taking Intro to Logic, Personal Finance, Tap Dance, 
jazz dance and Spanish one. But I am by no means a dancer. I have two left feet. Being able to be around a lot of other students is, is, is amazing. And I'm, I'm really thankful for everyone being so supportive. I was in getting there and kind of get shunned because like I didn't know what I was doing. Everyone helped me out. I really think it helps me a lot with my footwork and boxing. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of it. There's so many classes here that I'm, that are up for the taking, and they're just they're just a click away, you know. And so I, I I'm gonna use them until I can until there's no classes left. There's a lot of amazing things that struck me, but the main one is how many how many professional boxers were their class valedictorian. Honestly, I mean, if we had a survey, I, he may be the only one all the time, and, and uh, pretty impressive that we have him here, and uh, really cool. I, I happened to be at this uh, huge dance recital, and uh, Rebecca Miner, where's Rebecca? Is she here? Yeah, there they are. She filled this place. I mean, packed with people in, in, uh, sitting in, in the stairs. In fact, up there, I was in the second to the last row where I always am. And it was packed in, 15, 20 kids all around me. It was a fabulous, fabulous event. And about halfway through, I see Kiki, and I'm like, that's our boxer. He's up there <laughs> dancing. It was, it was really something special. Okay, we are closing in on snack time. And I don't like, look at me, I don't like to stand between people and their snacks. So we're going we're gonna to hustle. But we've got two, two more uh, broad goal areas to get through. Uh, the first is, is equity. Uh, our chancellor's office has made uh, equity a focal point for the last four or five years, which is awesome. I'm glad they caught up to us because we've made it a focal point since 2013 or 14. We put it in our 2015 through 25 uh, master plan. We've done some amazing things uh, in, in, in that regard. We said from the very beginning that we wanted to strategically tailor and implement academic programs and student services that match the unique needs of our student population and the demands of our workforce. And I think that uh, in, in large part we've, we've, we've done that, we've done some really special things and we continue to, to improve in all of these areas. We've got just the two, just the two objectives, but they're whoppers. That first one especially, reduce equity gaps in course success rates across, here's the key word, all departments by 40% from 2021 through 2025. That means that all of us need to be looking at this data and, and seeing, first of all, do we have equity gaps? And if we do, why and, and what can we do? Um, doesn't make any of us bad people as long as we're working on it to close those gaps. So that's a fabulous objective. Again, really gonna stretch our organization. And then the, the second one is increase the course success rate by 10% of our disproportionately impacted groups in their transfer level QR and their transfer level English in their first year. Another one, um, that's already stretching our organization. We're doing fabulous things in that regard, but those are the gatekeepers. We need to get students through those gatekeeper classes in order to get them transferred across the street or to UCLA or to Harvard or whatever. They've got to get through transfer level QR and English first. So great objectives. Uh, we've got some, some slides to share here. I think I shared this one in the spring. We were named a 2021 equity champion by the Campaign for College Opportunity for our work in awarding uh, ADTs to our Hispanic students. That's fabulous. We should be on that list every single year. And then shortly after our spring convocation, we got this in the mail. We were named the 2022 um, uh, champion for excelling in equitable course placement from the same organization um, uh, with respect to our placement for black students in English and math as well as math throughput. Those are, those are fabulous, and I hope we can get on this list again this year. So congratulations to both English, math, faculty, and, and, uh, and their administrators. Really, really special. Here's my slide. I love showing this slide because it, it really serves as sort of a barometer to how we're doing. Not an, uh, an end-all, be-all, but really a nice barometer to how we're doing with, with our various student populations. The column on the left is our, the demographics of, of our entire fall enrollment, in this case, fall of 2021. And you see that at that time, 72% of our overall student population was Hispanic. And then this past spring, we took the demographics for all of our successful completers. And you see that uh, the demographics for all of our award recipients, degrees and certificates, 
almost 72%, 71.5% were Hispanic, 69% um, of our degree recipients were Hispanic, and 78% of our certificate recipients were Hispanic. Again, not a mere image, there's still work to do, but we should all be encouraged uh, by this data. We've done the same thing with our black student population. In the fall of 2021, they made up 1.9% of our overall student population. That's, that's about even with Tulare County as, as a whole. And yet, last spring, they made up 2.3% of all of our award recipients. And here's the big one, 2.7% of our degree recipients. Really, really excited about, about that. And I think we can attribute it to all the hard work that you put in. You pour into all of our students. And in this case, uh, EOPNS, student su success, and a program like this, uh, AMEND. This is the AMEND conference down in Southern California last year. We took a whole bunch of our students and just had a, a great time. I could name probably half to two thirds of our students, but I wouldn't want to go there because I did, I'd end up forgetting some. But I can, I can name all of our staff members and I want to. On the far left, finding his way into yet another convocation presentation. Line it up, there he is, Kyron Wiley. Uh, to, Kyron, to Kyron's left, over his left shoulder, is uh, Mason Reese. If you come forward from the, the two of them in the front row, we've got uh, uh, Brett Kennedy. By the way, did everybody see Brett Kennedy's orange suit? That was sharp, wasn't it? I asked him, we're marching out for graduation, and I see that orange suit, I'm like, Brett, man, where'd you get that? Do they have like 50 XL, like extra long? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then I, I mentioned that to the folks uh, in our office and they said, dude, you'd look like Ronald McDonald. In <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll just go with the blue with the orange accent, uh, but Brett rocked it well. Uh, all the way across the front um, in the purple there, Miriam Salam, and then next to her, Juan Vasquez. Over Juan's left shoulder is Will Hobbs. Next to Will is Joseph Correa. Uh, next to uh, Joseph is Kenny Jackson. And then in front of Kenny is Elise Garcia. And then, then those last four surround one of our former students, uh, Jesus Carrillo. Uh, he was uh, uh, a EOPNS and AMEND student here four or five years ago. You may recall one of my first convocations, we had a, a video of him being surprised with a full ride scholarship at this very conference, a full ride scholarship to an HBCU in, in Nashville, Tennessee, um, Fisk University. And it was so sweet to see just raw, just captured him getting this scholarship. It was fabulous. He attended Fisk, he graduated, he got another full ride scholarship to Harvard where he's completed his master's degree. Fabulous story, I'd love to have him back for for one of our convocations. In fact, I'd, I'd love to have, he's probably gonna run for the President of the United States someday, but if we can't get him back for that, I'd love to get him back here working with our students because he is just awesome. And then the rest of these students just had a wonderful time. This is a program that's growing and we're really serving uh, this population of students. Uh, we've just hired uh, uh, Curtis Allen. Welcome back, Curtis Allen. If you know Curtis, you know the guy can recruit, and that's exactly what we needed for this HBCU Pathways program. Uh, we're doing a great job with all of our students, but I'd like to see that 1.9% come up to, to 3 or 4%. Very seldom do you get a chance to really move the needle in a program, and, and I think we have a, an opportunity to really move the needle if we can increase access to black students in our community and then continue to do the things that, that we do for all of our students. We can really see a, a difference in this community. So. Thank you for everyone that, that pours their heart and soul into these, these students. Okay, finally, we're close guys. We're close and I'm sure they're setting up Corner Bakery right now, but we have one goal area left and that is sustainability. Yeah, hey, hey, Teo Elise. <laughs> Let that serve as a lesson. Anybody that wants to get their picture on a convocation slide, plant a whole bunch of orange and blue flowers for me all year long and I'll put you in the slide deck. Uh, Teo's great and keeps our campus standing tall as well as all of our grounds, janitorial, maintenance facilities folks. Let's give them a big hand. Because, because part of sustainability is, is, is maintaining our, our facilities and these guys do a fabulous job with that. 
Uh, but it goes further than that. Uh, we've said all along that we wanted to engage in best practices and staff development to sustain effective operational systems. And we've got three, three objectives to do just that. Increasing the effective use of data and transparency in our decision making, improve communication practices and improve professional development practices and opportunities. Uh, we're working really hard on all those areas. There's our student success program on the right. What a great shot. Um, there were several things I could have shown up here in terms of, of slide. I chose to, to, to show you the uh, survey results from all of our participatory governance groups from the, the spring. And again, not an end all be all. And I'm not throwing it up here to think that we're perfect and we don't cuss and discuss things. We are a college, by the way. And, and we all know if you work at a college, there's gonna be disagreement. We're going to go back and forth on some issues. That's fine. We wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't. That's just the nature of colleges. But when you see unhealthy organizations, and, and we've all been on, or most of us have been on accreditation site visits, when, 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 when there's an unhealthy organization, these numbers are down in the 60s. People are just not happy. And yet when we polled all of our leaders in these areas, did you meet your roles and responsibilities? Were, were resources available? Uh, was the workload appropriate? Were we effective in completing our initiatives? Did we stay on task? And, and uh, did we behave ourselves in meetings? Did we adhere to Robert's rules of order? And, and they ran from 89% all the way up to 96%, either agree or strongly agree. That's the mark of a healthy organization, and I'm proud to be a part of it. So thank you for everything you guys do to make this a healthy organization. I have one video to share, and it's about graduation. But before I do, I wanna just add a little dovetail into sustainability, because I can show you all the charts and slides uh, that you'd ever wanna see. And yet, the only threat to sustainability uh, is ourselves. That's really the only threat to sustainability. We've been cooking, we've been cooking for 10 years. And this pandemic has set us back a little bit. Uh, there are those of us that are, are, are struggling to re-socialize a little bit. Not all of us, obviously. We had hundreds of people chipping in on those events I showed you earlier. I showed you 15 slides. I could have shown you 115. Uh, despite what I called earlier, the dumpster fires going around us all of last year, uh, we engaged students in a huge way. Uh, certainly engaged our community like I would guess no other community college in the state did. So hundreds of people are rowing in the right direction, but I know we're having some folks that are having a little trouble re-socializing. And I, I wanna be patient, and I wanna gently and lovingly bring everyone back into the fold. But there are those that, that, that for whatever reason, would, would like to bicker a little more than they should, or argue, or, or um, uh, the worst part is maybe attack some of their colleagues personally. No place for that, folks. There's no place for that. This is the best place to work in the entire county. I, I, I would say I'd put it up against anywhere, but certainly in this county, it's the best place to work. Thank you. So I wanna be real patient with folks that are just struggling a little bit, absolutely very patient, uh, and bring them along slowly. But if, if for whatever reason, um, you've kind of, flipped a switch and you're not the same person you were two years ago and you're not about serving students and, and helping your colleagues, then let's, let's talk about maybe a change of scenery because we need everyone, we need everyone um, rolling in the same direction because I feel like based on what we did last year in a, in, a, in a rough year, I think we have the opportunity to have the best year in the history of COS this next year. I really do. So finally, so finally, one, one last video. We always finish with a graduation video because, hey, graduation is our culminating event. It, 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 it should be like Christmas morning to children for all of us. To see our students cross that finish line is, is, is huge. And, and frankly, the thought of it is what pulls most of us across the finish line as well. Spring gets really, really busy. It's not uncommon for a lot of folks in here to work 13, 14, 15 hour days. It's not hard. If you, if you get up for something and you're here at seven, 
and you've got an event that night, and you don't get home till 9 or 10, that's 14 or 15 hours. It happens repeatedly in the spring, and nobody complains because we've got graduation. It just pulls us, it just pulls us through, and then you start reflecting back about this time of year, and it propels us forward into the fall semester. It's just a wonderful cycle of student success. So I wanted to share this video with, with all of you so we can leave on a great note. Again, um, we'll reconvene just to the south here in front of the Sierra building for snacks. Do your part. <laughs> Eat a whole bunch of food and take some with you so it doesn't end up right here and right here, okay? Thank you so much. Let's have a great day and a great semester. Getting here is an accomplishment on its own, and for that, I am proud of every single graduate here tonight. Sitting here with us, you see the resilient students whose college experience was unlike any other in the history of college education. Goals are hard to attain, but how do you reach them? You do not give up. For those who are first generation graduates, we have charted new ground for our families, and I hope you have found it worth it, because you are now a role model to those looking up to you. I am proud of my achievements here. I am proud of the irreplaceable experiences and opportunities I received here, and most of all, of the people I was lucky enough to meet while here. To the faculty, thank you for helping us grow in person and through a computer screen. Without you, we would not have been able to reach this accomplishment. My hope is that you are ready to turn your hard work and dreams into reality and never lose the will to learn. Wherever we go from here, my fellow graduates, may we be as proud of where we came from as we are of where we are going. COS class of 2022, we came in as students. We leave as giants. One final thing, I feel like Walter Cronkite here, but this just in, uh, you know that, that our, uh, the, the Visalia campus was embroiled in a door decorating contest. You're all aware of that, right? Uh, if, uh, get around and look at some of them. Katie Kane in our office uh, hand painted uh, about 15 different logos from throughout our history. Went back in the yearbooks and found, found logos for COS from back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. It's pretty amazing. In fact, it may be a permanent decoration on the president's office door. But uh, the uh, votes are in. The, the um, PACE committee went around their judges. They looked at all the doors last night. and. Uh, it says the, the numbers are in, and our new door decorating contest winner is facilities. And then one final thank you. I want to say thanks to Miss um, Sharon and, and Miss Jamie for all their hard work here this morning. Thank you very much. Folks, let's have a great morning and a great first week of school. Thank you very much.